go through that today, in case you were wondering. Dear Lord, again, we just invite you to be amongst us. I know wherever two or more are gathered in your name, you are there too, and we know you're here, and we thank you for being here. And as we open your word today, Lord, just open our hearts and minds to you. Spirit, come and fill us and teach us. Help us to learn some stuff, even just one thing that we can apply to our lives today. Or to be able to tell our friends and family and neighbors what's coming in the future so they can be prepared or get saved and, and not have to worry about it. We thank you, Lord, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so a few weeks ago, we talked... Um, about Jesus opening the seven seals, if you remember that. The seven seals brought on the seven angels who were given seven trumpets, and they started to blow them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and hail, fire, and blood fell, from the, um, fell to the earth. And it destroyed a third of the trees and burned up all the grass. The second angel sounded, and a burning mountain was thrown into the sea, turning a third of the sea to blood and killing a third of the fish and wiping out a third of all the ships that were on the sea. Then the third angel sounded, turning all the rivers and streams to bitter poison. And it was poisonous to drink, and men died during that time too. When the fourth angel sounded, a third of the sun, moon, and stars were blocked out. So, you know, big cloud of smoke and dust. And after that, an angel or an eagle, depending on which interpretation you want to use, it's still, if, it's, if you think it's an eagle, that's still amazing because God made it talk, right? An angel or an eagle flew through the air saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. The, the remaining trumpets are going to be very, very bad. Woe to those people on the earth. So that's where we left you, with a big cliffhanger, right? Because the next ones, <laughs> is that the pit of hell bursts open and demons come out, and they attack men, not the planet, anyway because the first four trumpets were focused on the planet, the trees and stuff. Men did die in those, but they were really focused on the sea and the streams and the trees and the grass. The next ones are focused on men, on people. As the next angel sounds, the pit of hell opens and all hell breaks loose. And I don't recommend being there. How do you escape that? You get saved today. So let's start reading Revelation 9, verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So we need to think about this in context, you know, about the interpretation, how you interpret the word star. You know, the way star is mentioned and how it is, you know, this star is given key. So it's, it's not like a star, shiny bulb in the sky that falls to earth like a meteor. It's actually an angel, right? So that just makes sense to me that when he says a star fallen, it's a, a fallen angel. So this angel fell from heaven to the earth and was given the keys to the bottomless pit. So who could this angel be? Any ideas? I and many other Bible teachers believe that this is Satan who has fallen. If you look at the, the tense of it, of the word, it's actually past tense. Satan has fallen. All the angels that follow him have fallen already, so he fell. And Anyway, when the star opened the pit, 
also called the abyss in Greek, smoke poured out and darkening the air and blocking out the sun. So this sounds to me when I read this like a real pit with real smoke blocking out the real sun. It's not just an allegory. There's a lot of people that say Revelation is just an allegory for stuff. And, you know, like, what does that mean? So if it's not real, then what is it? It's like it's like this, but it's not. It's like, you know, I'm a realist when I read the Bible, and it's not, you know, it's this is John describing what he saw. He saw real things that happen. On, in heaven and on earth, and he's describing this to us. This is his vision. So, you know, from his perspective, it's way different. You know, we have a different understanding of things, and we would describe it a little different maybe when we saw things, but I think he's describing a real pit and real smoke blocking out real light. So it's real. This stuff is going to happen. It's not an allegory. The pit of hell is really going to break open in tribulation. So, I just think people don't want to believe it because it is scary. That's why I said, hold on to the the promises of those songs. God is good. But yet, sin has consequences. The universe is broken because of sin and it has to be fixed, and this all has to happen because of sin. So get your sins forgiven today. Jesus died on the cross so you can. Let him be the Lord of your life. But people are scared of what Revelation says, and it can't be real. The pit of hell can't really open. (laughs) I believe that it's true. I believe You know, like I said, I'm a realist. It's going to happen. Verse 3, Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpion of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. Can you imagine what this is going to be like? Not only does a pit of hell break open and smoke comes out, but demons come out of the smoke that's coming out of the pit. You know, are they little locusts or are they big? You know, we, it doesn't say that what size they are. You know, you think of locusts, but a small one, they, they've been given power. And I believe, again, these are real demons who have real power, And they just happen to look like locusts in John's vision. And they are coming out of the pit, coming out of the billowing smoke. And they were given power. You know, demons don't have much power on their own. As they are stronger than us, they are, you know, above us, and they can bother you. But they can't bother you as a Christian, unless you let them. They are given power by God to do his will. Satan was given the keys and allowed to open the pit to serve God's purpose during the tribulation. They are not given permission to harm the grass or the green trees, which you think of a locust, that's what they eat, right? But these are demons, so I don't know what their main diet is, but they can't hurt it because... If you think about it, that's already been damaged. But they are given power to harm men. They can't do it without permission, but, you know, you as a person, I believe, can give demons permission to harm you by not being a Christian by not staying in touch with God, by not reading his Bible and applying it to your life and letting Jesus be the Lord of your life and letting the Holy Spirit come inside you and indwell. A demon cannot come in when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But they 
they're not given the authority to kill men, only to harm. And not all men, only men who don't have the mark on their forehead. So then that's like, okay, well, who is it that has this seal, this mark? Well, we read a few, a couple chapters ago, right, that an angel came down and, and marked 144,000 Jews on their forehead. Could it be limited to this group only? I have to say it could be. Or is it all the people who have made Jesus Lord of their lives during the tribulation? Again, I'm a, a pre-tribulation rapture guy, so we're going to be, as church, as Christians, we're going to be taken out. Back in chapter 4, we were raptured open door in heaven, and we went through it. So now we're talking about people who get saved during the tribulation that say, see, you guys leave, and they're like, they were right. I missed it. I need to get right with God. Ephesians 4, verses 27 through 30, uh, 32, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read a little bit extra on this. I mean, my point is one verse, but I'm going to read all of those just because it's something that I think is really good for you to think about. So I'm going to read, I like reading more scripture anyway. So anyway, Ephesians 4, 27. Don't give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's the key verse for there. As Christians, we are sealed. I don't know how that applies to the tribulation saints, but I believe they're sealed too, but it's a different type of seal than the 144,000 get marked on their forehead. Anyway, verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You see, that's just a good way to live life. That's why I wanted to read that whole thing, even though it was just one verse that is like, I read it, and I'm like, I, I'm going to read the whole thing. So apply that to your life. If you get nothing else out of this sermon, reread that one and say, this is good things to think about and apply to your life. <clears throat> but the point is that as Christians, we are sealed, we're set aside, we're, we're holy for the purpose of God. And each one of us has our own purpose. Find it and live in that. It's awesome. And also I read that and thinking, you know, salvation should change you. All those things that those scripture just mentioned are changes. The world doesn't do a lot of that. But as Christians, we should. Think about the good things. So we see some of the changes in that section of scripture that you should apply and make those. But when a person is saved, they are sealed by God. We are all sealed. The 144,000 Jews who were marked earlier in the book have a special mark on their forehead. The, the language here in, in chapter 9 seems to me to point towards 144,000. But I have to admit, I struggle with that a little bit. If it is just that 144,000 who are immune to the sting of the scorpion demons, then that means everybody else um, is vulnerable to this plague. But just because I struggle with it doesn't mean that that's, you know, the way God does it or not. Like, go right, Jim's right, everybody should be immune. 
No. Because it's a, it's a bad thing, and we'll talk more as we go in. But I want to believe that the demons can only harm the unbelievers. So, anyway. Because, you know, you think back in the plagues of Egypt, right? God sent darkness as was one of them. And all the land of Egypt was dark, so dark. I mean, they couldn't see to get around. All their lights didn't work. I don't know how that worked, but they had darkness. But over in, in where the, the little village where Israel was, they still had light. So God differentiated between his people and the world. I like to think that he's going to do that, that they are sealed and, and they, anybody saved during the tribulation won't have to deal with the agony that's, that's coming. Let's read on, verse 5. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. Okay, so again, they were not given authority. They can't kill or harm without permission. And as Christians... We have authority over demons. You can tell them to go away and they have to obey because you're a follower of Christ. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is. And it's authority given to us by Jesus himself. The problem with demons is we too often open the door and let them in. How do we do that? Well, with sin and, you know, watching bad TV shows or, you know, whatever. You know, you know what opens the doors, you know, in your life. What's right and wrong, you know. But we give them power over us by the choices we make, by the words we speak, by the sins we sin, by the sins we commit. We must be careful, Right? Christianity is 24-7. It's not just a come to church on Sunday. It's a relationship with God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, every year, the rest of your life. It's like when the disciples returned from their first missionary tour, they bragged to Jesus (laughs) that the demons were subject to them as they preached in Jesus' name. And Jesus warned them in Luke 10, verses 17 through 20. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. It's awesome. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to tramp on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Perception, right? Rejoice because your name is written in the book of life in heaven. Don't rejoice over being in control. That can puff you up. You know, all these people looking for demons around every bush and every, you got a problem in your life, well, you need to get that demon out of there. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Turn to the word of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Live right. Stop sinning. And they have no power over you. They only have power over you if you let them. If you're actively sinning, you're inviting them in. And sometimes if you let them get in and they have a stronghold, then we do need to go in with prayer and cast them out. But just living life as a Christian, being you know, put on the full armor of God and they have no place. Resist the devil and he will flee. 
And that goes for all his cronies as well. Like in verse 19, it mentions serpents and scorpions and the power of the enemy shall not hurt you. Back to Revelations 9, verse 6. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Isn't it intriguing that death will take a holiday for five months? That's, to me, that's kind of weird. But, you know, God is more awesome than he is so good. You know, death is an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? We all pay taxes and death. That's the two big things in life. We don't understand dying, right? As humans, we don't get it. Science don't even, you know. You know, we can see the, the mechanics of it when a body stops working. We say, oh, they're dying. They're dead. We don't know what happens when the spirit leaves the body or why. You know, we say it's death when the body stops. You know, when somebody's in the hospital, they're dying. They have the EEG probes connected to them, you know, watching the little monitors, watching their brain waves as they breathe and think. Little flutters on the screen. But when the line goes flat, right, they keep watching it, and it's flat. So then they pull the plug and turn all the machines off. But then the body starts searching for oxygen, or if it's dead, it won't. If it still has the life, it'll start searching for oxygen. And you can see little flutters in the brain waves. And they plug the machines back in and say, he's not dead yet. But if there's any life, they'll see that little flutter, plug it back in. But if it stays flat when they unplug the machines, then they're dead. It's over. We don't understand, you know, it's crazy. The spirit's gone, the soul's gone, the conscience is gone. They're dead. The question is, what releases the consciousness, the spirit, what releases the spirit from our body? And why is it we can see people in coma state for years, but the spirit doesn't leave them, yet their body's there, everything's functioning, but lights are on, but nobody's home. They can't do anything. They're just in a comatose state. Why hasn't the spirit left them? What keeps the spirit there? We really don't know what the difference between coma and death. I mean, other than it's like, we don't know. We can't give up our own spirits. We can't tell it to go away. These guys get stung and for five months they're suffering. They want to <laughs> just let me die, but they can't, right? Whereas Jesus on the cross dismissed his spirit. He said, no man takes my life from me. I give my life. I have the power to give it and I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. No man takes my life from me. And on the cross, he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit. He said, bowed his head and said, okay, you can go. <laughs> it is finished. The work is done. Jesus, our king, has the power to do that. He has the power over life and death. That is so awesome. We must understand the real me or the real you is our spirit. Not the body. The body is just the instrument that God has given for our spirits to express themselves, really. You know? The body is just a tent. Someday we're going to get a real house. But right now we live in tents. They're flawed. You know, they wear out over time. But the real me is spirit, which doesn't wear out. It's eternal this body is not. You 
You know, that's how God designed us, right? One day, though, soon, I believe we'll all get new bodies in the rapture. But generally through age, accident, illness, disease, or whatever, when the body can no longer fulfill the functions for which God designed it, for life and living, then God releases my spirit from this body. You know, I truly believe our lives are in God's hands. And I'm not going to die until my time comes when God says, okay, your work is done, it's time to go. Come up here, Jim. And then poof, my spirits go, my body's going to fall dead. Hopefully it's like that. Right up here while I'm preaching, it'd be awesome. Just, oh, my time. I said my last word and poof. Y'all don't be sad if I die. Throw a party, have fun, have a potluck. And just celebrate that my time, my work is done and what's next for y'all, you know, God has a plan. But anyway, sorry, rabbit trail. <clears throat> and my spirit then moves to be with Jesus. Eventually, we're going to get new bodies, which are going to be awesome. They will not decay. They will not break down. And again, I do believe we will get that as we're heading up to meet Jesus in the clouds when we get raptured. The Bible says we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye in an instant. Looking forward to that day. Especially today because I got this cold thing happening and I don't feel good. But during this five month period, the spirit will not leave their bodies. It's hard to imagine, right? No matter how much they want to die, they can't. You know, a lot of Bible teachers go off on um, suicide and all of that kind of stuff, but I'm not going to go there, you know. Are people going to do that or they just want to die? It's like when you're sick in bed and, and you know, you're not really thinking of suicide, but you will, there's times it's like, oh, just let me die now. It's like, anyway. But as we read the next few verses, don't get all caught up in what the demons look like. Okay? It's John's describing what he sees coming out of the pit. The important part is what they do. You know what they are. He describes what they look like. They're demons, and we're going to talk about what they look like, but I'm not going to go into depth. They have long hair, and they have men's faces, and they're like horses, you know. That's what they look like, but it's more important what they do and the result, right? Verse 7, the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold. That's what, it's like gold, but not, I don't, I don't know, anyway. And their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were Sting, and there were stings in their tails. Their power, excuse me, their power was to hurt men five months. So John is doing his best to describe what he has seen. But if you are looking at demonic beings, are you going to have, or you're going to have to use language that is, you know, how do you describe that? What kind of language do you use to represent these things? You know, but it always falls short. I mean, even today, you know, you see something happen and you go to tell your friends later and you're trying to describe it, but it really doesn't do justice as you watched it happen and you saw it and you have that detail in your mind, but how do you put that into words so that, whoever you're telling. And that's kind of what's going on. It's like John is seeing this. He's probably blown away. But he's, you know, so he tries to describe them, you know, somewhat. But, you know, I've heard a lot of Bible teachers talk about each thing, you know, why it's like, it's got to be beautiful. It's got a woman's hair. And it's got a face like a man. And it's all geared up for battle. And they have, you know, 
prophetic things about it, but I haven't found anybody that's really impressed me other than, you know what, it's a demon. They sting you in your pain for five months and you want to die, but you can't. That's, you know, what the scripture says. You don't have to overthink these things too much. If the Bible, if God wanted you to overthink this, he would add a little bit more to it or explain, you know, it's like this. It has long hair because... Or it has a face like a man because, but it just says this is what it looks like. It's a demon coming out of the pit of hell to wreak havoc. You know, and a lot of people want to compare these demons to modern day machinery, warfare, helicopters who have stingers in their tails and, you know, they have a face like a man. There's a pilot inside there, but, they, you know, it's like, okay, I'd take that. But if you look at the context, it doesn't make sense. Why do I say that? Because modern day machinery blows you up. It kills you instantly. There's not a lot of, I'm going to shoot you and you're not going to die. You know, if you see tanks and helicopters and stuff, it's, you know, this is it. It, the context doesn't make sense. That's why I just keep going back to the realistic view that this is demons from the pit of hell, from the bottomless pit, the abyssal, the abyss. And they are eagerly waiting this day when they can be set free and torment men. You know, they want to torment men because they've been tormented. They're down in the pit of hell. And I just want to let you know, if you don't see it the same way I do, you think it's modern day warfare, I'm not going to, you know, kick you out of the church or anything. No. It's okay if you disagree with me on that, but, you know, from my perspective, I'm a realist. But the truth is, we don't really know what John is describing here, other than the words he's given us, and how you interpret that. But the people that see this happen will understand it. Be like, oh. Pastor Jim was right. Look, they are real demons. No, <laughs> I'm sure nobody's going to be thinking about me in the tribulation. But although we are leaving these videos for them, right, so they can come and listen after we're all gone. But they will sting men with their tails, and the stings will cause massive pain and mental anguish. If you look into how a scorpion hurts men now, it causes massive pain and can actually, you know, cause mental anguish or stuff. Anyway, depends on the scorpion. Some are just as bad as a bee sting, and others are lethal. So there's all kinds of scorpion things. And those who get stung will want to die but can't. Five months is a long time to suffer, don't you think? I mean, I've been sick for three days, and I'm already tired of it. I'm not to the point where I want to die, you know, but five months with physical pain and mental anguish, and I don't know how bad it's going to be, but it sounds pretty bad. If they want to die but can't, five months is a long time to suffer like that. Don't you think? Yeah. Verse 11. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon. But in Greek, he has the name Apollyon. So the words Abaddon and Apollyon, whatever language you want to speak, mean destroyer. So that's another name for Satan. So Satan is the leader of the demons. We knew that. He's the destroyer. And oh, what a destroyer he is, right? He loves to destroy stuff. I mean, look at the world around us. You know, look at men who have been destroyed by the power of Satan. Look at what he's done to the church. (laughs) I look around at the Christian church and I'm like disgusted. Our families. How high is the, the divorce rate? Nowadays, does anybody know? Well over 50%. 
That is just sad. How many of you know of family or people who haven't had a broken family? You know anybody like that? I can't name somebody right now. There's somebody, okay. But it's rare. One hand shows, you know, it's like, that's crazy. Well, unless you talk about Nancy and I and our son, but that's where it started because we're, but my mom's on her third, or she just divorced her third husband. My dad's been divorced twice. It's like, I actually, you know, was divorced once before I met Nancy, and she, you know, so it's, it's broken. Marriage, Satan loves to destroy relationships, but we have to stop him. How? By reading the Bible together, by making God the center of your relationship. Stop letting the devil come in and talk you into divorce. People let Satan do this by not teaching their kids the Bible. Do you have any idea how many youth leaders in America don't believe the Bible? It's a massive number. It's scary. I get emails from different groups that watch ministries, and they're always pointing out this youth leader or that pastor's molesting kids or this or stealing money. Or I mean, it's just the church is so broken, the families are broken, and people just oh, turn back to God, people. And we, we stop having that relationship with God and we stop having a relationship with our spouse and we stop having a relationship with our kids and we all have our own screens and we, uh, you know, don't have dinner together anymore. And it has destroyed this world. It has destroyed this country. Get back to the basics of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 12, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So here again we see after these things. So I truly believe Revelation has an order. A lot of people like to mix it up or take it as, you know, something totally different. But it has an order and it follows and says, this happens, after this, this happens, after these things, this happens, and after these things, this happens. And it's, you know, you just read it through, and it's, it's like, okay. It makes sense. But the first of three woes is past. That was a pretty gnarly woe, wasn't it? The worst is yet to come. The judgment increases in intensity. Is it all, y'all okay if I go late? Because it's like 11.05, and I still have a, a couple more verses. Anybody got to go? Okay. <laughs> then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the gold, um, golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. So these fallen creatures, demons, so awesomely fierce that God has kept them chained up for the last 6,000 years of man's history. They have been kept for this exact point in time and they entered and are going to enter the world to accomplish their mission. Again, they've given per God gives these ones permission to kill. They are freed to slay a third of man. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. If you remember back in the start of this with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, when the seals were start when Jesus started breaking the seals. One quarter of the earth's population was destroyed, probably more than that. <coughs> and now, by this fierce, these fierce angels, 
loosed out of the river, the river Euphrates, another third of the earth's population is destroyed. So in the first one, you think 8 billion people on the planet, a quarter of that's 2 billion, right? So you take those out of the equation. So now you have 6 billion left, probably a little less. A third of that is like 1.8 billion. That's a billion with a B. People are killed. Up to this point, that's half or a little more of the world's population dead by these plagues. That's, That's a lot of people. And it could be more than that. If you, you know, you calculate all the men who drank the poison water or were destroyed in the, the ships on the sea when they got destroyed or, you know, it, go, it goes on and on. So, wow. Verse 16. Now, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red. Hyacinth, blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. So now we see 200 million horsemen riding, 200 million horses with riders on them. You know, we're not told if it's humans or demons, right? Is it a human army with modern-day warfare? And John's doing the best he can to describe these helicopters and tanks and how they work and you know, what comes out of their mouth or out of their tail is perspective, right? But I believe personally that these are demons who are under the command of the four demons that are leased from the river Euphrates. They are all working together to kill a third of the world, killing with fire and smoke and brimstone. I mean, if you read it in context, It's like all hell breaks loose on earth during this time. You know, some say it's human armies, modern day machinery. I can kind of go with that sometimes. I think, wow, that really does, you know, a lion's head and fire and, you know, but it could be. But I personally really think it's just going to be demons and they're given power to do what they want to do, which is kill you. Verse 20, I think I'm closing in on it. We're not doing too bad. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And so the judgments of God do not really bring men to repentance. Judgment and that. Man hardens his heart against the judgments of God. They think it's not fair. I'm a good person. Why are you, you know, letting these demons do this to us? Paul said, don't you realize it is the goodness of God that brings a man to repentance? I said, focus on those songs we sung this morning. The God is good all the time. At the foot of the cross, he did it for us. That is why I seek in my message to preach the goodness of God and emphasize God's grace. It is the goodness of God that brings men to repentance. When I first got saved, I was a fire and brimstone kind of guy. If you don't get saved, you're going to hell. Well, that's true, but it's how you say it. God is good. Come to him. Or if you don't, you're going to hell. 
I don't talk about the judgments of God that are going to come and wrath, as I don't like to talk about those. But I do have to talk about those, the wrath of God, because the Bible teaches it. But if I didn't teach it, I would be derelict in my duties. I have a responsibility to you to teach you the whole truth. And it kills me. There's so many churches I've sat under, other pastors who I call sermonette pastors. They teach for five or ten. They take one verse. They get an idea, and they bring in a verse or two to support their idea, and they throw it at you. But, I mean, I, that's why I just go through the Scripture. We get it in context. It's God speaking, not me. Anyway, so when the Bible brings up the bad stuff, we talk about it. When the Bible brings up the good stuff, but I always like to finish a bad sermon with good news. We have salvation, and it's free for you, but you have to stand up and take it. Stand up and take it. So, and Jesus did that. He would tell somebody something bad, you know, you're living in sin, but there's salvation for you. But the judgments of God just kind of harden people. When you're a fire and brimstone, it turns people off. But when you talk about love and grace and mercy, they're like more open to that. But I always like to follow it with the good news. So even in the midst of this horrible period of judgment, which hasn't happened yet, they continue their worship of Satan and idols. And that just breaks my heart. They just don't get it. So next week, we're going to, you know, get into chapter 10. And I was thinking I might get into chapter 11, but I, probably not. We'll just do chapter 10 because next week we do communion and then we have potluck. So I'm going to try to keep it a little shorter than this week. So I went over this week so I can go under next week, right? Is that how that works? And then we can eat. So that's going to be an interesting one. It's very... Uh, controversial chapter in a lot of controversials, you know, anyway, we'll talk about that next week. Leave you kind of a cliffhanger. No. <laughs> it's a, it's a little bit softer chapter than this one was pretty harsh. Anyway, dear Lord, again, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your name. Again, we thank you for your word. Even the bad stuff, because we just learned about you and your character and your plan and what's expected of us as we read these things. And we just thank you for salvation that you have supplied for us. Even though we didn't deserve it, you did it anyway. Help us to understand all of that. And as we go our separate ways, just be with us, fill us, guide us, direct us, give us wisdom and knowledge. Give us insight and understanding. Help us to apply your word to our lives. Help us to understand what it is to have a relationship with you. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock back here. Next.